So welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us for this Tanemel Global Talk, where Leo, co-founder and CTO of Wearable Devices, and Alexander Brutowski, team leader of firmware uh, development, wearable devices, they're gonna talk about Mudra. So reinventing tiny interfaces for ubiquitous digital interaction. Um, so as usual, as for our Italian and global um, talks, I'm going to through the initial slides a bit of housekeeping um, before they are going to present this very interesting uh, topic today. Um, of course, before we start, we need to thank all our TILML strategic partners for uh, making all these events uh, possible and, and basically share, spread the knowledge about TILML worldwide. And um, here, but I want to thank, uh, thank AZ, Analog Devices, uh, Arduino, ARM, Brainship, Edge Impulse, Efficient, Green Waves Technologies, Gravity, Inc., Hymax, IBM, ImageMob, Infineon, Inatera, Microsoft, Not AI, NXP, Pollen Technology, Kixo, Qualcomm, Renaissance, Snyder Electric, SenseML, Sony, uh, Silicon Labs, SD Microtronics, Synaptics, Sinchens, and TDK. So again, thank you all for making these um, these uh, free events uh, possible. And as I said, also to, to allow people around the world to know more about um, uh, in novel solutions in the area of TinyML. So uh, these are just some numbers about uh, how the tiny ML group is growing. It's growing incredibly because of a certain of the interest and the uh, incredible opportunities that, that tiny ML is bringing in the education bar and in the industry sector. So we have a rich, we are definitely above the 60k members uh, in the tiny ML meetup group. So we have 49 groups in 41 countries. We just need one more to reach our first milestone. Um, so it'd be fantastic, honestly, to celebrate. And also on LinkedIn, the, the stats are not uh, are very good. So we are getting 4K members. Uh, we are uh, so, um, above the 12K uh, followers. So don't, uh, if you are not part of the meetup group or you're not part of LinkedIn, so I recommend to uh, to sign up to be always up to uh, updated on our events and, and global uh, meetup groups. Um, in terms of um, uh, the tiny ML global uh, talks and other events, um, as you probably are aware, um, most of them are recorded. And all you and you can find all these um, videos on YouTube. This is certainly the right place if you want to learn more about TinyML. The content that you can find here is from very beginners to very advanced uh, developers in the TinyML space. In the YouTube uh, channel, we have uh, more than 10k subscribers with more than 600 videos. So it's absolutely uh, a great place to start. So and also in this case, don't forget to subscribe to our uh, Tanema YouTube channel. Um, also, the video, uh, the, sorry, the presentation we're going to host today will be recorded and will be available uh, probably already tomorrow on the YouTube channel. Uh, in terms of next events, well, TinyML Asia is approaching very fast. So November, November 16, uh, 2023, will be hosted in person in Seoul, in South Korea. Um, so uh, definitely here there is a link to discover more and also to, for being updated about the uh, speakers and, and, and presenters that, that are going to have the TinyML Asia um, um, uh, event will is gonna have uh, this year. I'm honestly looking forward to it. And the other thing, a um, um, very important update, is about the 2023 Edge AI Technology Report. This is um, a, a resource where you can learn about the state of the art in hardware and software in Edge AI. So, so that you can learn about the technologies that you that are enabling uh, machine learning uh, at the very edge, uh, like. Um, microcontrollers, uh, in, for instance. 
so here we have reported the link, the Weevolver link. So uh, don't hesitate to download the uh, do report from the link reported in this slide. And I think that's it. I'm going to introduce the two speakers, Leo Lenga, so we, who serves as a seasoned data scientist and co-founder uh, and CTO of wearable devices. He has been leading the company's biopotential sensing algorithms from a garage initiative all the way to a successful initial public offering on NASDAQ. Before his venture with wearable devices, Mr. Lenga held key roles driving algorithms developments in numerous organizations across diverse modalities, including content ranking and X-ray applications. He earned a bachelor's degree in an electrical engineer from Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, and a master's degree in applied mathematics from Tel Aviv University. The second speaker is, is Alexander Pirovsky, who is the team leader of FEMA development at wearable devices, specializing in the field of embedded software development. Alex is currently focused on the development of gesture recognition algorithms, bringing extensive experience in the development and integration of sensor drivers. His work is distinguished by his innovative approach to low power solutions, ensuring the efficient use of resources without compromising functionality. Alex has, has a proven track record in implementing a substantial number of HID devices and ensuring their seamless integration across multiple operating systems. He holds a master degree in computer science from the Kiev National Polytechnic Institute. His unique combination of academic rigor, passion for technology innovation, and dedication to energy efficiency, efficiency continues to propel him forward in the wearable devices industry. It is my pleasure to welcome um, Leo and Alex, and definitely the, store, the, the stage is yours. So thank you, Gian Marco. We're very excited to be here. I'm excited to be here, and I know Sasha is excited also. So we'd like to talk about a few very cool things in the most visual way possible. So we'd like to talk about human-computer interaction. We think that today, this should be done dramatically different. So we'll explain this in the most simplistic manner. And then we'll talk about ionic exchange. And the value will break this down, this technology, into two phases, the part where we explain the anatomy, how our bodies work, and the other part, how we explain how sensing works. And then we'll talk about algorithms in the field of sensor fusion. And by that, we mean how we take two different sensors and two different elements that see different things and combine them to get the most out of, out of for human computer interaction. And we'll talk about software implementation and the, our system and the app and how it um, sort of interacts with the app operating system. So the, we begin with the first most naive example, okay? The most naive example is the way we control an air conditioning today. So we want to turn on the AC. It's really hot where we where I live right now. And so to turn on the AC, I need to find my remote control and then point it to the, to the device and then it, it turns on. What, what we want to do really is to just point at it, click and have it turn on. And so that's the first. But further, if we look at the smartwatch, okay? So the smartwatch, the screen and the interface that we use to control a smartwatch is adapted from the smartphone, right? It's just a small screen and, and you need two hands to control this. So what we suggest is controlling with one hand, single hand and with gestures such as tapping, twisting and me and Sasha will talk all about such gestures. And third and most maybe most important for a lot of the things going on today in the field of spatial computing. So we have devices coming out like the Apple Vision Pro. And so the Apple Vision Pro, the, the way that the interface works is with cameras and sensing. So with, with depth sensors, time of flight, et cetera, and a number of camera arrays. So the way this works requires significant amount of power. And though we suggest a different way, a way that uses biopotentials, for fingertip pressure. So this is the value for interfaces and we'll discuss this. And this is Mudra, the device I'm waving here right now, right? So I'm waving my hands on purpose. 
So it contains many of the electronics that we have, that we're all familiar with. We're familiar with BLE, power, LEDs, but the unique things that we are that, that we bring here today to show you are the SNC surface mirror conductance sensor array that is embedded on a flex PCB. So it conforms to our hand and wrist very well. And we also have an IMU together with this. So together, these two sensors give us some indication, a noise indication, right, of sort of a picture of what our arm does and what our fingers do. And we'll show this, and we have some links in this white paper, whoever wants to expand. Yeah, hi, everyone. It's really great pleasure to be here. And uh, what we are trying to achieve, it's uh, first of all, to compete with the computer vision and bring in the our modern world some device that will be able to control and manipulate it with your uh, meta universe such as vr uh, glasses and so on and so on so what we are actually doing it's like neural clicker first of all it's like your general mouse that you're able to connect in any any devices in the world and second that's it will be able to track the finger pressure and tap drag and drop and other things so with this, we can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So neural clicker. We are using SNC sensor. This is biopotential array sensor and IMU motion uh, motion sensor with accelerometer and gyroscope that's able to track your hand position. So SNC we are using to achieve the pressure level and IMU to able to manipulate with the mouse pointer. Go next. Uh, so our main feature it's drag and drop. If you will see that there is a lot of devices that's right now capable to bring tap only from the IMU, and but there is no such device. I'm not talking about computer vision that's able to actually understand that you are pressing your hand and you are still pressing. You are not releasing. And this is. For nowadays, you are able to achieve it only using the computer vision, but using the biopotential sensors such as SNC, you're actually capable to track the finger pressure uh, with the bionic exchange, which Leor will tell more. Thank you, Sasha. <laughs> so, the, the, the um, what are we sensing? What is a biopotential sensor? So, the way we'd like to explain this, and uh, afterwards we'll talk about, we'll first begin with the phenomena of the body, how our bodies work, and then the, the actual electronic sensing, because they're both, they both go together. They're a, they're a team. So the way we chose to explain this is with um, videos that are taken from the anatomy and physiology lectures. They're really great, and you can check them here in the links. So these, um, the idea and the marketing, we have, first of all, in our um, in our website, we have this marketing video. So we're controlling our device. Some this woman is pressing her fingers. There's an action potential, some sort of a, some sort of a message between the mind and our fingers. And then, um, and, and then this, this is the control, this is the sensing. And, and I'm here to tell you, we're here to tell you exactly how this works. So in our bodies, we have that when two excitable cells would like to pass on a message between each other, there is an electrical and also a chemical reaction. And so it's not so simple as in electronics. And we'll talk all about this. So we'll break it down, okay, into three stages. The first is the formation of an action potential. The second is the propagation of that action potential throughout our body. And the third is innervation, how our muscles work. So when we're at rest, we're like a battery. And that's an amazing thing that you know, I've learned throughout the years developing. We've both been, been seeing this through and through. So the way this works is this at rest, when we do nothing, we're charged, okay? Our arms charged. There are sodium and potassium ions within the cells. And inside the cell, the potassium and negatively charged ions. And so totally there is a negative charge. So if we look at the axon, our hand, right? So we have a membrane, a plus and a minus, similarly to the way a battery operates, right? So that's how it is, just with ions, these specific ones. And so what takes care of this 
this charge, right? It doesn't happen just by magic, is the sodium potassium pump. So this pump drives the, the, um, the ions back to their place if they're in the wrong side, so to speak. So when we get a stimulus, let's say, for example, uh, some sort of something scratches our arm, right? like, uh, and this opens up the yellow gate, the mechanically gated sodium channel, and it opens up a bit. And so within our body, the, the, um, um, the voltage on the cell membrane goes a little bit up from minus 70 all the way to like 55, minus 55. But if it surpasses this threshold, then something interesting happens. And so the interesting uh, thing that happens is the opening of the voltage gated um, sodium channel right here. This one's voltage gated, right? So it opens up to, due to the voltage in these sodium ions, they rush in and you see the voltage go up on the cell membrane. So it reaches around 40 millivolts as you see on the <clears throat> image to the right. And then it falls. It falls due to another mechanism, the voltage gated sodium, the voltage gated uh, potassium channels, excuse me, uh, play that again the potassium ones, right? And they make the, um, the voltage go down. So now there's a falling phase. And so they go to the other side, okay? And finally, and we've been familiarized with this, um, the, the action potential, the, the value of the voltage on the cell membrane, it stabilizes due to the, to the sodium potassium pump, which we sh we've shown. So just skip to the next slide. And that was part one, the formation of an action potential. And so this is the, the first stage of the magic. And the second stage is this propagation of this action potential throughout our arm. So now this, the sodium potassium channels open up and in turn, they interact with the next sodium potassium channels and so on. And this process propagates similar way to when you throw a stone in a pool, so to speak, right? In, it, it will make the water ripple and the wave go to the other end. So along the myelin sheet, it's not exactly the same. And the third stage is the stage of the innervation. And here, what happens is the action potential rushes through, it's coming into the other side. Now it needs to pass its message to the other side. And the way it does that, it was interaction with the calcium. So now calcium chemically is transmitted to the other side and it will latch on to the other side transmitting its, its, its message. So we have a phenomenon that is composed of both an electrical and a chemical in reactions. And so it is very unique. And in the last part or, or getting to the muscle, now this action potential reaches all the way down to the sarcolemus very close to where our fingers are, where I'm moving all the way to the T-tubules, where the calcium now will rush inside. And what it does, it will make the, the muscle contract. So now we have an electrical, chemical, mechanical reaction. And so muscle contracts like so. And you can imagine that now it, this muscle, when it contracts, it pulls on a tendon. The tendon, in turn, pulls on the bone and on our fingers move. Similar way to what a marionette would move, would move those marionette. So we find that extremely cool. And this flexion that we do works in the, sim, in the way uh, that is, this is the anatomy. So yeah, let me describe uh, our milestones, how to bring such a unique action to the real product, to make it more real, to uh, make more uh, adjustment to this. First of all, what the first milestone was data acquisition, how to collect data, how to record it, and actually prove that our concept is real. So we develop, uh, sm we develop the mechanism to send everything in the most efficient way, and we develop small button. When you are pressing, it sends true or false, simple as possible, with the signals. Yeah, as Lior, you can see it on the lower camera. He showed the cam the buttons in the neck. Uh, so here you can see that our idea of ionic exchange is actually real. You can see on the slides that's SNC and red uh, mark that's only show true 
and the pulse like raising up and down. And you can see with the graph that SNC are moving. So this is SNC signals comes 15 milliseconds before actually you press the tap. And you can also see that uh, on IMU, where the graph that's tap physical, it's responding only after the SNC signals, and which is extremely interesting. And uh, it was a little bit uh, on the beginning, uh, we faced a lot of uh, issues, how to optimize the system, how to send everything as much as possible with as much as possible frequency to detect uh, even small phenomena. Uh, and we use the queuing mechanism with the round jobbing. So we are making the prioritization because, uh, as you know, as many people know, that Billy has still a lot of issues. It's under development. And while well, you're developing uh, with low power device that's sending in real time a lot of data, you will face several issues. Uh, so our system right now, uh, here you can see the data acquisition that's coming. Very interesting video is for me. Uh, so here you are explaining that's our idea with the buttons. When he's pressing, it sends uh, its closed circuits and it sends true or false. And if you will move a little bit video on the middle, you can see our signals that are coming. It's coming to the application where the application parses this and showing on the graph. So with this, you have capability to understand that we are not describing something theoretical. This is already like real product. This is already uh, data that brings uh, capability to our data, data science team to parse it, to develop the algorithms on top and start working. And with this, this is the first uh, milestone was achieved. And the second milestone for sure, after we will develop all the uh everything that's possible on the tf light we will bring everything to the tf micro and uh yeah. next so here you can see a small diagram how the actually system are working we have snc sensor and imu if you will use a not dma process which is blocking mechanism you will face the issue that cpu usage will raise up more than 80 percent we are using cortex m4 and this is NRF5283. Uh, and if you will use the blocking mechanism, you will raise up on almost 80%, and which will bring huge skewing, huge data corruption. All the system will work slow as possible. With a DMA mechanism, with a burst reading, with a reading chunk of the data on the hardware layer, not on the CPU layer, on the logical layer. And all marshalling are done on the hardware layer, and then it's sending, according to the queue, it's sending to the Bluetooth to application site. And all the parts of the computing are done on the phone, part of the computing is done already on the firmware layer, such as twist gestures, such as uh, small top gestures, bring to site, uh, falling, uh, wake up on motion, tilt, and other gestures. So we develop a decision tree to make dynamic prioritize what is actually to send. Uh, yeah, what is actually to send. Yeah, then you need to a little bit uh, skew, you need to play with the uh, BLE core parameters with a, a general attribute table and MTU. As my suggestion, always use the biggest possible package and one single package for everything. Thank you, Sasha. And I just want to want to point out that the, the button, which seemed, you know, you, you saw the video, it's collected in the Technion. Um, so this, this, this data collection procedure enables us to bring labels to data that you don't have labels. You, you, you either you do um, manual segmentation that is very long. And so, or you construct some sort of a mechanism like this button that we've shown you and we have other sort of setups to collect data. So it's, we have now labels for supervised learning. And that is simply amazing. All in real time, all working silky smooth. So how does the sensor work? The sensor is, is uh, the second part of this, uh, the theoretical explanation, right? So the theoretical in the sense that you have a link here to see if you'd like to explore more. But the idea is that when we put place a certain material in proximity or in contact with our skin, 
then something happens. We're able to interact with the ions that we discussed. And so when Sasha showed you for pressing the fingers, right? When we showed the video, that means that, and, and, the, and the electrodes are proximity to the skin, right? So now we can pick this up. However, do, there are challenges and the challenges mainly revolve around the, the difficulty in, in measuring things after our dead skin. So we have layers of dead skin. We can model this as inhibition, some sort of, we, we don't have immediately like a zero um, resistance. We need, we need to overcome some, some um, problems. So they can be modeled as a series of resistors and capacitors in parallel. Usually one of them is very dominant. So that's what happens when you have a single electrode placed in proximity to the skin. There's also a half cell voltage because there are different, the different materials cause this um, voltage potential to, to, to happen. So there's a lot of details if you'd like in the Q&A, we can go more in depth on such things. But the idea is given such noise and issues, we want to build we've, the sensor that is actively removing noise and actively controlling the situation. So the idea is to, to with active amplification, with amplification to remove noise with differential sampling, and also to keep the, the difference, differential sampling lows noise, and also the common mode noise low. So you can think of such a sensor, which doesn't have a ground, as more of like a control mechanism that balances itself out without a ground and less of an amplifier. So that's how the way I would envision such a, such a system. I, we placed these slides again because they were so cool. And I wanted to just to go a little bit in depth on what we see here. So we see here, um, when you see the red, the red SNC is the button, right? So that's the button, that's the label that Sasha provided the algo team with. And in there, following this, before this label, this, uh, this block, you have, um, you know, the, the latency, you see that there is a reaction in the SNC uh, prior to the uh, IMU oxabrometer. But furthermore, look at the difference between the two taps. These are two taps from two different people. And so one tap on the left-hand side is more of a vibration tap. The other is somebody more like, pressing on his fingers. So you could see that the SNC is longer, right? It's not a momentary like it's like a like a press a, a press and so that's that's the 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 differences between people the way they they interact with hci and move and so there's also noise right so noise allows us and the button is zero right no no labels here it's all noise so there's nothing interesting in the sense happening here on the left hand side you see me drumming so when i when the table hits when i hit the table Table, you see a large vibration in the accelerometer vibrates. And, and on the top, you can see when I move my hand like so, there's a little bit of friction with the electrodes. So you can see that sort of noise. And on the other side, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of walking around with, with my fist so you can see that what, 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 it, what that looks like. So we just wanted to sh share with you this data because it's super cool. And so the bottom line right now with the, 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 the value here is that we have these two sensors we, we want, we showed you and Sasha showed you the latency. So the latency is low, right? The power is low and we're gonna talk all about that. And it, we can sense not only pressure, but also not only vibration, but pressure. And so these two go together. And, but the downside is you require some proximity to the skin and skin contact. So that's how um, biopotentials work. And in a white paper, we discuss human computer interaction. So in human computer interaction, really what we're, when I'm typing here on my keyboard, then I'm pressing on the, on the keys, right? So when this keys appear on my screen and it's a continuous process. So that's how human computer interaction works, sort of like communicating with everybody here. And so without the feedback. So the, the way though, that, that this process of pressing a key in a similar way to tapping involves so first of all, a thought and intention, which you can sense with biopotentials, at least when the intention is, 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 is significant enough and surpasses the, and creates an action potential. And the movement can be sensed with an IMU. And so the switch, which when it closes a circuit, it gives us the, the, the true, false, one or zero, and that's not necessary. We can, we can um, figure that out before we even press the button. So that's the amazing thing about such 
such a device, okay, and, and such a concept of controlling things. And so, if we look at sensor fusion, and we talked about these two sensors, there's two dramatically, I would say, computationally different methods. One would be neural nets and the other random forests. And so, and based on feature extraction methods. And so when you combine two sensors in, in the sense, fusion in the sense of getting the best out of both worlds, like in the table that you saw it two slides ago, then in neural nets, the yeah. key idea would be to use concatenation in a layer followed by that in some intermediate layer. So you got 9U and S and C, some computation, some layers, and then a concatenation, another layer. And we've tried various things to pull this layer with various loss functions and create some various to control the embedding spaces. And so we, you, can, we can, you can really control this to keep the noise and to keep everything sensible. But on the right-hand side with random forest and feature extraction, such methods have proven to be more complex as you can imagine all. And so when you create um, such um, features that combine multiple uh, features from two sensors, then really that's not really good to build a feature that, that combines the two. We had more success with just feeding them to the random forest and the contribution with the majority vote figures that out in a sense. So we can, we can discuss this further more in the quick Q&A, um, but what you get with two such computationally like extreme methods would be one, have a very refined high, dim high dimensional here, two dimensions, but a very refined dimensional, high dimensional space that can be, a border can be constructed in a very curved manner. And with random forest, we tessellate the, the feature space into rectangles and well, we can, con and, and the features are constructed by ourselves. So as we all know, so, so it's more uh, limited, but possible. You, it is possible to do sensor fusion uh, with both. So we have many possibilities. And so, but the problem is the problem that we're that we're solving is um, building classifiers that are able to adapt to different people. Okay, so the the different people have different reactions, as you've seen. Um, and so the the classification problem is is such that it requires attention to such thing. And also, when we we build the gesture data set, we decide what it is. So when you define such a when you have the opportunity to define such a data set. And you can control how how the how it will all turn out, right? So you have control over over that also. So that's the 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 setup for gesture recognition. And one more thing that I wanted to say before uh, Sasha talks about uh, the interesting things that have been going on with TF Micro. If we look at two extremes, right? We have mobile nets on the left, tiny neural nets on the other side. So. When mobile net came out, right, the efficient neural nets on, on mobile, then those neural nets require around hundreds of multiply and accumulate or multiply and add operations. And so on the right hand side, you see neural nets that require thousands or so uh, MAC operations or MAD operations. And so that is very different. And we've been using the tools created by the tiny ML community, also including some very cool layers. Um, efficient LSTM layers, et cetera. So maybe you talk about a little bit about the Zephyr. It was really uh, nice. Sure, yeah. Uh, when we started developing, our second milestone was to migrate to TF Micro and do everything embeddedly. And as beginning, because it's very important for us to use, uh, to have not the big CPU usage, not the huge uh, RAM application and the flash application. We did small tests. We implemented on the TF Micro uh, with Zephyr. We use the TF Micro and we just start testing what the CPU usage, what the flash size, what the RAM size. And it appeared that's all part of the sending mechanism to support uh, uh, big packages, to support high frequency throughput, to support everything. It's required even more than uh, uh, this small model. Mono, can you go next? Uh, so yeah, as Lior mentioned on the few slides ago, that's uh, what we are facing and what we are fighting, that's variability between users. Uh, so you can see that our device, it's flexible and each person wearing it's in different way, like this, like this, doesn't matter. 
So when we start developing the air mouth algorithm uh, to track where you moving like left and right, delta y, delta x, um, we face the issue that uh, when you are putting your position like this or like this, it's very <laughs> it's very hard to manipulate and become like left. So left is always left and right is always right and up is down because variety of the users, a variety of uh, how you put your bands and where is the IMU because it's not static position. So we, so we started with a cursor projection to understand where is the ground and dynamically switching this. And this feature is already implemented. We actively using this, this milestone we also achieved. Uh, so second feature that was very important for us, it's momentary tap versus drag and drop. Uh, momentary tap, it's when you tapping in high frequency, you're tapping with something and you want to achieve, uh, let's say like a default mouse, it's give you ability to tap like 10, 15 uh, taps per second. It's really great result, but uh, with a all this back and forth, sending mechanism, computing, you need to also achieve at least like 10, 12 uh, uh, clicks per second. And this milestone was also achieved. We right now almost like uh, seven clicks per second, which is a really great result uh, because it's hard to understand where you're pointing and also drag and drop. So distinguishing, it's also achieved by the state machines where you're <coughs> pressing, holding, uh, the slope effect, that's a cooldown, and a lot of logic behind. Uh, so we are using yeah, HAD, general mouse uh, descriptor, and touchpad, and keyboard, d-pad, uh, to variety of devices. So there was on the QA question that uh, what's doing the tap. Tap can sense if it's uh, iPhone, it can sense click, but uh, it's HID, so you can make the, your own presets. If you'd say you can press and it's enter or like this, you can even put the shortcuts like we are doing for the Mac OS. Also, it's very interesting uh, was to discover this ANCS, Apple Notification Services and Apple Media Services to distinguish in between neither it's iPad or Apple TV or iPhone. I'll explain why, because uh, on the Apple TV, there is no cursor and Android TV. You're not able to just to put your dongle with a mouse to the Apple TV. It won't work. With this, you need to develop the remote controller, HID descriptor of the remote controller, and uh, how to develop this mechanism of the switching. This mechanism on the switching is done on the background when you receive the notification from the Apple that you actually connected and you actually working with the Apple TV with significant parameters, with everything you easy to switch and response to action. With Apple notification services, you can respond to the incoming call, volume, you can see already what's done on the system. When there is message, you do the twist and it's clear your notification. Or when there is receiving call, you put, uh, you enabling the signals because you receive a notification from the Apple, there is incoming call you enabling the sensors from the sleeping and you do tap and you answer the question uh, and you answer the phone call. Yeah. Right now, uh, because uh, our device doesn't have any interface like the button, screens or whatever, because our concept it's only hands-free device. So you don't have any interface with you. Uh, we are using iPhone as interface where you have capability to switch the speed, switch the mouse accuracy, uh, toggle between a lot of varieties of parameters. So iPhone here, it's becoming your interface where you are capable to toggle between devices. Let's say here you can see device number one, device number two, device number three. With the broadcasting, well, you connect it to the iPhone, you're sending all the signals. And then HID commands to the device number one. If it's Apple TV, it's remote controller button. If it's iPad, it's stylus. If it's MacBook, you're using trackpad. And if it's iPhone, it's it's just on the mouse. Now, with this, you need to develop the blacklisting advertising, direct advertising, really nice pairing mechanism, which provide you Nordic SDK. 
the pairing, the all this process really done well on the Nordic SDK and so. So the next slide, we can see our main competition. Our main competition is computer vision versus our system to prove that our system can bring interesting varieties, can bring interesting solution for other customers, for other people, neither the computer vision. First of all, that's uh, the price of the manufacturing. The price of the manufacturing of the camera, it's way higher than simple IMU and the, our bionic sensors, SNC. Uh, second, that uh, IMU, it's low power sensor, and the SNC, it's also low power sensor, which is comparing to the camera where you can see that uh, we just uh, put some, uh, we found the middle value of the camera power consumption, it's uh, around 500 millivolts, and, but 500 millivolts, it's not connected through the BLE, it's not uh, sending data. This is just camera consumption where the camera is active. And when we are connected to the device, we're connected to the second device. We are enabling the signals. We are sending these signals. We achieve 10 millivolts, which is we are right now using 30 milliampere hour battery. And our device can run on this uh, situation uh, almost to 10 hours, 10 hours, which is great result. And with the computer vision, 30 milliampere hours of the battery, it's it's nothing. It's really nothing. Uh, also, but there is several issues with our approach. Uh, and this is the disadvantages of the accelerometer, gyroscope, and SNC, because you need to, first of all, denoise the signal. You need a lot of uh, signal uh, filtering, which we done high pass, we low pass, and everything done on the CMC side with the arm, so it's really optimized. Oh, with the computer vision, you don't have such problem with the noise and uh, signal complexity. Uh, but also, is a great advantage of the current hour system. It's weight of the device. If you will take the Oculus and all this weight of the cameras are like really huge, but the minuses of the our current system that it requires skin contact. That's why you increasing the complexity of developing the flexible device. Flexible device that will be perfectly aligned with your skin. I I, I think you covered. Uh, we covered everything, and I didn't understand how you during the presentation you read the QA. So, but we're ready, Jim. I think for the QA. Um, so we, this, this, the, the last slide that Sasha discussed is in a nutshell, what we're saying here is that it will be very hard to build the gl smart glasses, like so very sleek, like a Ray-Ban, um, with, with electronics embedded inside. And we have another sort of approach to this and, um, and, and yeah, and this is, thank you for taking the time and hearing about wearable devices. And if there's more QA, I'll just, Gianmarco, take some of those questions. Absolutely. And honestly, it is a, I mean, a great pleasure, a great presentation. I really enjoy it. Um, so I'm going uh, to the Q&A session. So I'm, I'm going to change the slide because I think the next one is to uh, for. Give me just one second. Okay. Oh, maybe I can go to the previous slide. Yeah. So let's start with the first um, question. Is your gesture set predefined and fixed? Can the user add more than a personal gesture to your system? So I the, you, we can always add more, but I think the slide that you should, depending on which gesture can be added. So let's just sort of show the feature spaces, the fun. Fun part, right? So if we add more gestures, then the feature pet space becomes more constrained. But sometimes gestures are completely unsimilar. So it depends on the gesture. If if we're going to do this and this, it's much much harder, and it requires calibration. Calibration is a procedure that we that we've developed. That you give a few examples in the style of few shot learning, as most of us are familiar with in the TinyML community, and we're able to adapt to such a scenario. 
So it, but it depends also on the on the, the gesture. If it's just anything, then it could constrain the the, the you know the the idea of, of of manipulating the feature space in such a way that it can be a separate person. I hope I answered. Also, I think it will be very interesting to end. There was a. Uh, some demo that we provide to customers where he controlled the robot based on HID keyboard commands. So when he was press and hold, there was right arrow key, up arrow key, left arrow key, enter space, and so on and so on. And then they parse this HID keyboard input to customize gesture of the robot. It was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice. I, I, I think Absolutely. I think you have answered this question. So, um, okay, there is a question about data collection. Uh, hold on. Um, how do you describe how systematic you were in collecting data? Did you collect adequate data across age, gender, body measurements, such as the height, weight, skin color? Did you need to oversample particular types of your subjects? Yes. So, if I may, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, yeah. Of course, we've collected thoroughly the data in the tech, and but we're never happy with the scale of the data. I'm never happy. Come in the morning, we collect more. There's always more, and that's the oversampling. Because if you think about this, and unless everything is covered, right? If there's some sort of problem, right? Product team comes. Sasha comes to me, say, okay. This scenario, unique scenario where I'm, my hand is like this and I'm like this, something happened and, and, and I want to fix that. So we collect more, we oversample the situations that are more difficult. So data collection for biopotential and for such gestures that should be, in my opinion, um, it should be it should be oversampled. It should be over-representing some things that are more difficult to, to discriminate. So, we have a, a thorough gesture data set with different uh, skin types, uh, weight, gender, of course, um, but we're always expanding it. And whenever, and that and that brings me to the next question, if I may, G and Marco, the M7, we, we would, of course, we're always in the procedure of expanding and, and Sasha talked about um, one, one flavor of our hardware, which we're developing. And so we're also developing, we're expanding the, the, the hardware capabilities to do more. Um, however, um, the, the collection, the more we collect and the, the tighter it is, the more we can, the data speaks for itself in a sense, and we can remove uh, some of the computational constraints. So it's intermingled in a sense. And, um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's, and it, 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 and depending on the exact experience, you need to, again, collect and again, need to choose your computation wisely. So I hope I, I answered that. Um, Sasha, maybe you take the next one with the DSP. Uh, yeah, right now we are using uh, uh, Q31. Hold on, hold on. Uh, I'm just, that, just read the, the question for, for the audience in case they haven't seen the question. So <clears throat> are, you, um, are your DSP processes mainly running using fixed point numbers? Why do you believe floating point is not necessary if you have opted to fixed point? Uh, right now, yeah, we are using uh, fixed point numbers and uh, flood point number. It's on the current stage, only on the current stage. It's not necessary because it's uh, a lot of marshalling, just a lot of marshalling to convert from the fixed point to the float point. It's few more marshers. That's why on the current situation, it's more optimized to use the fixed point numbers. Because from the ADC sensor, you're receiving the uh from the mu it's uh a 16 bit adc and from the snc it's a 24 bit resolution yeah so yeah thanks a lot so have you explored sequence based models such as recurrent neural networks if so yes. why have you not continued to use them we're con we're using them so we're continuing to use them. We're always continuously doing different things. So as we've mentioned, and we're continuing to expand our capabilities. So it's an ongoing process, but we're using recurrent neural networks. We find this, the fit very nice for these sort of problems, I must say, 
um, they have a lot of advantages. And I know that in, you know, in more advanced, I don't in the, the world today, LSTM, outside of the tiny ML community, it's not exactly what is being used in, you know, in more advanced things as ChatGPT as we've seen today. But it's amazingly efficient in, in such time series data as you've seen here in biopotentials. So we do use them and we find them fascinating and we're exploring, we're squeezing out all we can from those. And those, uh, and LSTM done right, done right. And we've also shown this in the tiny mail posters and so on. Done right, um, LSTMs can be extremely, extremely efficient in, 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 in embedded and also extremely efficient for time series data such as what we've seen right now where data is modeled time by time. The vibration is something that goes up and down. There are more details here. It's not that you feed such raw data to a neural net and you expect the, the, to everything to, to come out. There's a lot involved in these pipelines, um, but maybe I'll keep that for another, another tiny message. So there's a lot to say about this question, really. I hope I answered it and I can answer furthermore in the mail um, to discuss this in depth because there's a lot to say. Many thanks. Another question is about the uh, sensor type. So why don't you use a mag magnot, uh, magnot, magnot image uh, in your device? Why don't you use uh, uh, this for, um, for recognizing the gestures? I think it's mag magno magnometer. Yeah, I can say that it's magneto magnetometer. Magnetometer. Okay. Yeah, so, Perfect. Sasha, that's, that's one for you, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, I will take it. Yeah, I think magnetometer can bring a lot of capabilities for us. I was also all the time speaking that uh, magnetometer can fix the drifting issue and several other issues, but we choose the ICM 2064 with DMP. This is digital motion process that's done all the quaternions uh, and uh, yeah and other uh, algorithms inside the DMP, which is really low power and can brings a lot of capabilities. Although we faced a lot of issue with this uh, digital motion process, that uh, quaternion algorithm was not that great. Uh, linear acceleration also from this algorithm was not that great. And when you are using the black box, like the DMP, because you don't know what itself uh, it's doing, it's not that great. So as for me, magnetometer, yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. I have another question actually on, on this, still on the sensor. So um, in this presentation, we have learned uh, a lot about the SNC sensor. Uh, are you using a proprietary uh, SNC sensor or are you using um, from a, from a from another vendor. So is uh, your proprietary solution? Thank you guys for that question. It's our proprietary solution patented and we've been working on it and proud of it for many years. So that's the, the and take a look here. Just wanna point out. So these are the electrodes. We do all them, everything in house um, regarding this manufacturing and these sensors. But the idea is to, to customize um, the technology of sensing of biopotential sensing to the wrist. So in our wrist, um, th there is, um, yeah, nice, thanks. That's the, the hardware without the band. So you can check out Sasha's video there. You can check out how, how things look a little bit more closely. Yeah, so it's all, it's all um, custom. Custom sensors that we've been um, adapting to the wrist specifically for a wearable um, device that latches on and it's a strap that connects to uh, to the phone. So wh why we, we did this, because there's no really other, we, we believe this, that there is no other good wearable. You have, um, what most people do is wear a watch, right? So we wear a watch, that's what we just do. That's the wearable we use. And we wanted to build a, a product that, you know, that that connects to this wearable, to a known something. So the strap is, is, is our proprietary algorithm, sensing, technology, et cetera. That's cool. Thanks a lot. 
So here is about a question about the battery and the um, the EM fields that could be generated by the battery. So can these electromagnetic fields confuse your sensor, for instance? Yeah, charger, so yeah, when you're charging. Yeah, we can Sorry. split it between both of us. Uh, so, so, first of all, no, no, you start, you start. <laughs> uh, the, the answer is yes, when uh, we are using the charging and the charging of the battery because of the ground, uh, it's confusing the sensor. And you continue. <laughs> That's all. So, uh, so, 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 yeah, it's, it's, the confusion, we have a lot of, we, we know that such problems may arise. So in our architecture, we have a power management integrated circuit and other, um, let's say we, we, we keep this in mind, right? We take care that there is a minimal amount of, of interference, but it is possible with such a message. It's, it's, it is possible for one, you know, within an electronic device, one would influence another cause some electronic interference, but we keep, but we, we know how to deal with that. Thank you. So another question is about, okay, does perspiration cause issues? Are there health issues or outliers of potential interest in the data? So, yeah, um, that's a great question. And that is another, I think, complete lecture on polarizable versus non-polarizable electrodes. And so different electrodes have different properties and different ways they create contact with the skin. And so it's deeply fascinating, but it's a, we'll need to, to, to talk about that in an email. But yes, it can influence the signal, not sweating. That, that can just sometimes also help out with conductivity depending on the electrode. But there are situations where our skin or differences can cause issues. And that's why we also record data in these situations. So yes, there, there, is, there are mm, issues, but we know how to deal with this in a sense. So we take care. Yeah, we're aware of these things and we work around them through them. Thank you. Uh, Okay, can you talk more about the uncontrollable variables that impacted performance of the device? Then tightness, sweat, EADA, how this get compensated by the recognition algorithm? All right, so it's a good question. Our approach is to see this when we when we build a company, when we have, when we work together, when we when we present together. Then we we think we, when we thought about this, we knew that these different issues were were going to be were pop up. So oh, the the way that the company is built is very interdisciplinary. We have design manufacturing experts, um, algorithm experts, and firmware experts. And so for each field, there is there is someone or some team that works to make it state of the art. So yes. There are many challenges that the, that is uh, that are raised in the, and they're true. It is a challenging problem. Otherwise, such technology would already have been implemented. But when when we talked about the sensor fusion, that was the interesting thing because using two sensors, you can get in a sense the best of both worlds. So let's say let's say right now I'm sweating, right? So now one sensor here just going to put on my band. One sensor here. Is, is gonna be, my SNC is now, let's say noisier, okay? So now I will need to rely more on IMU. And though, so this, this in, to, to get a tap. And so the, 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 the contact with the skin can be mitigated. Problems can be mitigated with this um, sort of interplay between the two. And so, yes, um, it is, it is um, so we have the drag and drop and the different capabilities which we discussed. And, and we work through this. We work through this in the engineering level and also in the experience level of the product. So again, it's 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 a great question, but to answer it fully, I will need an email and we can talk all about it. So, thank you. Many thanks. 
well, probably you have realized, but from the many questions you have um, you have seen today, the interest on this topic and actually the brilliant presentation you have delivered today. There are three more questions. I'm not sure we're going to have time, uh, but the first one probably is quite, quite quick. What is the main difference between the SNC uh, sensor and the EMG sensor? So SNC is tuned to the wrist. And in a wrist, there are no muscles. EMG picks up direct muscle innervation. And so in a wrist, we have a lot of different things going on. We have the, well, all the slides we discussed and crosstalk between different muscles in our wrist, in our arm, etc. So the main idea is it is a very similar technology. Also ECG, also EEG, they are all sensing on different parts of the body. But when you tune a specific sensor to a specific place in the body, it, we, we give it, we honor it with a name. So that's what we did. That's perfect. So there is also um, a problem, I don't know if it's a question or, or a comment about the brain, um, I mean, the, the low power voltages generated by the brain. Can you also use a similar technology to capture these um, voltages? So I'd like to say that, that that is not part of what we do right now. And so we focus on neurons um, and technology that is the motor neurons. We didn't talk about this, and this is the end of the presentation, and I won't go too much in depth on this, but motor neurons are more stable. You want to control the motors and not the thought. Thought Sensing thought is, is a deeply... Yeah, CTO. Sensing thought is, is, is indeed uh, something that we're, we're more... Um, that, that requires further, further more... Um, so that I won't go into, but, but the motor neurons are what we're interested in in the head. So we focus on the hand and the wrist. And last question for today. So um, uh, about the uh, inference, inference time. Uh, do you have some specific uh, time that you need to meet, first of all? And did you use quantization to get better, better latency? So that's a great question. We've used quantization, of course, and that's really nice. And so, yeah. The latency, um, so yeah, oh, there, there's different different things. Yes, quantization um, diminishes the latency, but we talked about two, and I just want to stress this: the mobile and the embedded side. So when you do things on mobile, there is there are no real computational constraints for such problems. You can do deep neural nets is 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 as far as your you know your imagination goes, right? And so, but with embedded, you must be more careful. So of course, this quantization is truly crucial for embedded and um, and we've been using it. It's really nice. Along with the other uh, the great software that's been written by the tiny ML community. So thanks for that. So thanks a lot again for your brilliant presentation. Uh, we also hopefully answer all the questions in the QA uh, tab. Uh, we're approaching the end of this uh, talk and I'm going just to present the remaining slides. Um, I want to thank you again, uh, Leo and Alex for this um, in very interesting presentation. I'm pretty sure also you're gonna receive quite a lot of emails um, to learn more about this, uh, this solution. Um, since we're approaching the end of the presentation, once again, we want to thank all the time and strategic partners that are making not just this event, but also all the other events that, um, uh, free and um, and in order to spread the knowledge of uh, Dynamat worldwide. Um, in particular, we want to thank the executive uh, strategic, strategic partners, uh, which are Qualcomm AI Research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Sentience, accelerate your edge compute. The Platinum Strategic Partners, which are Atrios, deploy vision at the edge at scale, Sony. The Gold Strategic Partners, uh, analog devices, ARM, Edge Impulse, Infineon, Inatera, Microsoft, Renesas, 
ST Macrotronics, Synaptics, and the other silver strategic partners listed here, which are AZIP, Arduino, Brainship, Efficient, Greenwave Technology, Gravity, HIMAX, IBM, Imagimob, North AI, NXP, Polling Technology, Kixo, Snyder Electric, SenseML, Silicon Labs, and TDK. And that was the last slide of this um, super, very interesting presentation. So on behalf of the Tanemer Foundation, I want to thank you all for attending this, um, this talk. Uh, that it will, and then, as I said, it, it, this it has been recorded and will avail, avail, available on YouTube uh, already uh, tomorrow. With this, I would say, let's see at the next time ML Global Meetup. Bye-bye.